we're go. Yep, go. Thanks, thanks, Alvaro. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. I hope you are all enjoying beautiful University of Connecticut, um, especially this time of year. So um, this talk is a little bit has a little bit of a different flavor from uh, some of the more algebraic talks that you've uh, been hearing so far. And uh, even if you don't get the details uh, of what I'm going to talk about, if I was going to suggest that you take one message away from this, it's that um, like many of you, I went to graduate school with a very definite opinion that I liked algebra and I did not like analysis. <laughs> and uh, 20 years into my career, I cursed myself for not paying closer attention in my real analysis classes, and I wished that I had taken functional analysis as a graduate student. So the message which I'm here to convey is that although it sometimes is hard to see from the trenches, mathematics is actually a unified subject, and uh, you never know what might be useful in trying to understand a problem that you're interested in. So. Um, Good. All right. Well, so this talk's going to have a little bit of analysis in it. And um, so here's an overview of the talk. I want to talk a little bit about classical Fourier analysis, uh, which maybe you've learned about in a course on partial differential equations or something like that. Or maybe you took a, a serious analysis course, unlike me. Then uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the piadic integers from the point of view of analysis. So I want to talk about the space of continuous functions on the piadic integers and a theorem called Mahler's theorem, which gives you a very nice, complete description of what that space looks like. Then I want to introduce the ideas of distributions, characters, and the Iwasawa algebra. So this is kind of the Fourier theory part of the talk. And at the very end, I will say just a tiny bit about what this is all used for in the setting of uh, the construction of piadic L functions, and it's useful in many other contexts in, in arithmetic as well, but I won't, uh, I won't be able to say very much about it. So that's the strategy. So let's talk a little bit about Fourier analysis uh, in the classical case. Uh, so Fourier analysis in this context deals with compact abelian topological groups. So a uh, topological group is a topological space, which is a group, and for which the group operations are continuous. So multiplication and inverse are continuous. Uh, classic examples of compact topological groups are finite groups with discrete topology. Uh, so the entire theory of finite groups is incorporated into this. And then Maybe the best and most important example to keep in mind is the group of uh, complex numbers of absolute value one, also known as the unit circle. Okay, so that's the group. You can multiply complex numbers of absolute value one, and it's a compact topological space, namely it's the unit circle, and multiplication is continuous. When you start to think about um, Fourier analysis, the first thing that you end up having to wrestle with are the notion of spaces of functions. And this can have a big influence on the direction that your theory can go. So two important examples of um, spaces of functions that you can think of on your compact topological group are, first of all, the space of complex valued continuous functions. So that's C of GC. And this is a vector space. You can add functions and multiply them by complex numbers. And it's also a metric space because you can take the norm of a function by taking the maximum value that it attains on this compact space G. And that the norm gives you a metric, just like we did with the piadic numbers, where the distance between two functions is the norm of their difference. And such a, and in that, the vector space operations are continuous, and that's an example of what's called a topological vector space. In fact, it's what's known as a Bonnock space. It's a topological space, topological vector space with a norm, which is complete with respect to the topology of the norm. And you can also think about Hilbert space. Uh, I'm not going to give the full definition of it, but roughly speaking, it's the space of functions on this circle, in this case, which are square integrable. So you can integrate the absolute value of f squared and you get a constant number, you get a, a number. And you have a dot product 
where you take the integral of f times g bar over the circle, and that gives you a Hermitian inner product. Once you have function spaces, you can construct, yeah. G is, in principle, any compact topological, abelian topological group, but you can think about S1. It, yeah, I've written it for the circle. Christelle conveniently mentioned Haar measure. In the case of a, if you, if you know these words, then you can construct this in general using Haar measure. Distributions are, one way to think about distributions is that it's a kind of integral so it's a machine which takes a function and converts, a num converts it to a number. So the idea would be that a typical distribution uh, is, a, for example, an L2 distribution is a continuous linear map from the space of L2 functions to the complex numbers. And, you, and a, a continuous distribution is a linear map from the space of continuous functions to the complex numbers. One way to, you can, some people write these things like this. They would write it as the integral over G of F D lambda. F goes to the integral over F of F D lambda. So that's the sense in which a distribution is like a measure on the group. And um, in the case of Hilbert, by Hilbert space theory, any such continuous distribution is actually gotten by taking the dot product against a function. This is sometimes called the Hilbert space version of the Ries representation theorem, if you've studied this. And it's the analog in the infinite dimensional Hilbert space of the fact in finite dimensional vector spaces that if you have a non-degenerate inner product, that any linear form is gotten by dot product against a vector. So as I mentioned, you can think of a distribution as a kind of integral. And just to give you one very concrete example of a of a distribution, there's what are known as the Dirac distributions. Namely, this is the linear function, which take linear form, which takes a function and evaluates it at the point x. And at least on continuous functions, that makes sense. Uh, there's also, as Christelle mentioned, in a very general setting, um, an invariant distribution of mass one known as the Haar measure. And in the case of the circle group, that's one over two pi d theta. So that sends f to the integral of f d theta, 1 over 2 pi, theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. Those are examples of distributions. OK, we're almost through the ingredients of Fourier theory. The next ingredient is what are called characters. So this is the group theory part of it. A character is just a continuous homomorphism from the group into the circle group. Here, the circle group pays a slightly different role. It's the target of the map. So in the particular case where G is the circle group, we'd be looking at homomorphisms from T to itself. The set of characters are a group because you can multiply them together. So they're an abelian group themselves and you can put a topology on them so they form a topological group, although typically they're not compact. In the case of the circle group, the continuous characters are the maps of the form Z goes to Z to the N, or if you prefer E to the I theta, goes to e to the i n theta. Those are the homomorphisms from the circle group to itself, which are continuous. And so from that point of view, the space of characters is the integers. Each integer n corresponds to the character phi of z is z to the n. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to answer that. At the risk of getting it wrong, it depends on what your function space is, I think. Okay, and then finally we can talk about the Fourier transform. So in this abstract setting, the Fourier transform converts a distribution into a function on the dual group. So the Fourier transform turns the distribution, which is a linear form or an integral, into a function. The group changes. The group changes from the original group to the dual group. And the formula is the value of the Fourier transform on a character, if lambda is a distribution, is what you get if you plug the character into the distribution. So this, it all seems kind of very abstract here, but 
the Fourier transform of lambda evaluated at, char at a character is what you get if you plug the character into the distribution. So it's a number. So for each character, you get a number. That's a function. Why is this called Fourier theory? Well, if you take the particular case that we've been talking about where your group is the circle group and your characters are the functions of the form n goes to z to the n, and lambda is a distribution which corresponds to taking the dot product against a function g lambda, then the function that you get on, remember the dual group is the integers, and the function on the integers that you get are the Fourier coefficients of g lambda. So there's one Fourier coefficient, one complex Fourier coefficient for each integer n. That's the function on n. And the reason for that is, if you just compute this, it's the integral of e to the i n theta, g lambda bar d theta, 0 to 2 pi, 1 over 2 pi. That's the definition of the dot product. And that's essentially the complex conjugate of the nth Fourier coefficient of g lambda using the theory of Fourier series. So in this fancy version of Fourier theory, the coefficients of the Fourier series of a periodic function are the values of the dual of the Fourier, the values of the dual, the values of the Fourier transform on the dual group, which is the integers. If the group is not compact, the situation is a lot more complicated, but the Fourier transform for the real numbers has a similar feel to it. So just to recap, the key ingredients are a compact abelian group. We looked at the circle group. A certain space of functions on that group, like continuous functions or L2 functions. The dual of that space, that is to say measures or distribution. Characters, which are homomorphisms from the group into the multiplicative group. And then this abstract process, which turns a distribution into a function on the character group. Okay, this is a very basic process in representation theory. If you've taken a course in representation theory, at least for abelian groups, you would have seen this as well. Yeah. Yeah, so you can still take the you can still take the Fourier transform of a continuous distribution. You get the Fourier transform of the I mean you take you get the Fourier coefficients of the Fourier transform of the continuous function. The problem is, I mean, you get numbers. Maybe that's the right way to put it. You take the distribution, you get numbers. If you take that corresponding Fourier series, relating it back to the distribution gets you into complicated reasons why I never wanted to study analysis in the first place, having to do with the relationship between the Fourier series of a continuous function and the continuous function itself. So this gets you into very serious analysis. I've just sketched a kind of conceptual picture of it here. And if, if there are any analysts in the audience, I apologize. Okay, so now we're gonna try to do this piatically. So in piatic Fourier theory, we have to sort of put together the ingredients of what we just discussed. And the ingredients are, well, the group that we're interested in is the piatic integers, the additive group of the piatic integers. So that's a compact abelian topological group. Uh, Christelle mentioned that, it, that it'd be, uh, if you have a discrete valuation ring with a finite residue field, that the, the, that ring is automatically compact. One way to see that ZP is compact is to observe that it's complete by construction and it's totally bounded, which means that you can take, a, it has a finite covering by open balls that are arbitrarily small. And the arbitrarily small open balls are the residue classes A plus P to the N ZP. If N is large, those residue classes are open balls which are arbitrarily small, but there's only finitely many residue classes. That proves that ZP is compact. We're going to look at the space of continuous functions from G to K, where K is a complete extension field of QP. If you want K to be QP, that's fine. Okay. If, if complete extension field of QP means something to you, you can use that. That just allows you, remember, we looked at functions on the circle with complex values. Here we're allowing the values to lie in a bigger field so we can get in things like roots of unity, which might not be elements of QP. 
it's not crucial. But we're going to look at the continuous functions on this compact group with values in a p-adic field. We're going to look at the distributions, that is to say, the linear the dual of that space. We're going to look at the characters, that is to say, the homomorphisms from G, which is ZP, into the multiplicative group of the field. And then we're going to use the same machine that we did last time. Given a distribution, we're going to convert it into a function on characters. And that's going to be our Fourier transform. Now, um, there is, by the way, I should say, since ZP is a perfectly legitimate compact abelian group, we could take the field to be C, the honest complex numbers. And there would be the Fourier theory of the kind I discussed in the first half of this talk is totally legitimate in that case. And uh, that's the kind of Fourier theory which plays a role in the construction of, say, the Riemann zeta function by the methods of Tate's thesis. If, again, you've seen this. So there you're looking at complex valued functions and you're looking at their Fourier transform. We're interested in continuous p-adic functions of ZP. And the big difference between p-adic Fourier theory is that there are many, many more continuous p-adic functions on ZP than there are complex valued functions on ZP. Because of the fact that ZP is totally disconnected, every open set is also closed, one consequence of that is that p-adically, a locally constant function, like for instance, the function which is one on the, if f of x is one, if p divides x and zero otherwise, this is a p-adically continuous function. And um, that's kind of a strange, you don't have that in real analysis. So, um, there are many more continuous p-adically valued functions. The other problem is that there's no L2 theory because to have a non-degenerate form, you need to know what a positive number is, but p-adically there are no positive numbers. And finally, the Haar measure exists and the Haar measure assigns to the spec, the, the Haar measure of the, of, the, of the ball p to the n zp for the very good reasons that Christel indicated has to be one over p to the n, but this is a small set, and this is a big number p-adically. So the Haar measure p-adically has the property that small sets get, what we think of as small, get big by the Haar measure. And that means that continuous functions are not Haar integrable. So the whole representation theory that's based on the Haar measure and the whole Fourier theory based on the Haar measure goes out the window periodically, and you need to think of something else. So let's start by talking about continuous functions uh, on the space of periodic integers. And feel free to interrupt me if I'm talking nonsense. So again, G is our, is our abelian group, ZP, our compact topological group. And K is an ex complete extension field of QP, which if you like, you can take to be QP itself. And we're gonna consider the space of continuous functions from G to K. And what are some examples of such functions? Well, one of them I already mentioned. You can make locally constant functions. So for instance, you can take the function which is one on PZP and zero elsewhere, or you could take the functions which are, you know, one if X is congruent to five mod, 23 and zero if x is not congruent to five mod 23. And these functions are continuous. If, if it's not clear to you, and I wouldn't expect it to be if you haven't worked in this field, um, you should think about why locally constant functions are continuous. Um, it's, it's more or less a translation of the fact that open sets in ZP are closed together with the compacts. So um, you should think about that as a little exercise in topology. Um, another important class of functions that are continuous are the characters of finite order, of order p to the, yeah. What is a Schwartz space? Oh, you mean where you have rapid decay at infinity? Yeah. So if you were doing the, the classical kind of Fourier analysis, you might consider functions on QP. And then you would be concerned about their behavior at infinity. But we're sticking here to compact things, so we don't have to worry about about uh, about decay at infinity. Um, 
Okay, so the characters of finite order take a p to the nth root of unity and take a p-adic number. You can raise a p to the nth root of unity to the power of a p-adic number if we use the power series expansion that Christelle talked about just in the last talk. Because when you raise your p to the nth root of unity to a power, which is a p-adic number, and you think about this power series, eventually you've got p to the n's out there. But zeta to the p to the n is one, okay? So you can sort of throw away all of these terms out here once the exponent is bigger than n and just take zeta to the integer power that you get by throwing out everything which has got p to the n in it or higher. And that gives you a continuous function on, the P, on x. And this is why I allowed k to be bigger than qp, because if I want a p to the nth root of unity, I don't have those in qp. I need to go to an extension field. These are useful to have. And then another, you know, perfectly legitimate continuous function on ZP is just take a polynomial, x to the fifth. Uh, that's a continuous function uh, of a p-adic variable, just like it is of a real variable. So there's a pretty uh, rich set of continuous functions on ZP, okay? And uh, because this space of continuous functions with values in K, uh, is, it's a K vector space, right? You can multiply a function by an element of the ground field and it's still a function and you can add functions together and they're still functions and continuity is preserved by these operations. Um, yeah. Where? Well, this is just the soup norm of a function. When we get to the linear forms, we're going to need to divide by something. But here we're just, this is, f is a continuous function. zp is a compact set. So a, the, a continuous function on a compact set achieves its maximum value, right? So um, we just take the maximum value over, its, uh, over the points in x, and that gives us a norm on the space of functions. And once again, you can prove that this is a complete uh, topological vector space. And the completeness, again, you know, all that stuff that you prove in real analysis and in the discussion of metric spaces, there's a general fact which is proved in a lot of uh, these courses. I, th I think I found it in Munkries or one of the sort of standard textbooks, which says that if you have a, the space of continuous functions from a compact metric space to a complete metric space with the soup norm is always complete. This is more or less an exercise in uniform convergence. So uh, the space of uh, the, the limit under this, if you take a Cauchy sequence of continuous functions with respect to this norm, the limit is continuous as a function on ZP. That's what that says. Okay, and we wanna now, in order to do Fourier theory, we need to understand this space of functions. But the amazing thing is that this space of functions has a very concrete structure. Uh, and the structure comes from a theorem due to Mahler, and uh, it's based on a generalization of what's called the finite difference calculus, which goes back to somebody named Isaac Newton. So um, how does this work? So for, for some integer n, let's think about the polynomial function, which comes from the binomial coefficient. So it's like I've got there, x choose three is x times x minus one times x minus two over three factorial, but, but now x is a variable, okay? So this polynomial has some interesting properties. Namely, if you plug an integer in for x, you always get at least a positive integer. If you plug a positive integer in for x, you always get a positive integer out, even though this polynomial has three factorial in the denominator. Maybe you have never pondered this amazing property of the binomial coefficients before, but it's actually a lot of subtle divisibility is going on in these things. So it's a general fact that if you take these polynomials and you plug in a positive integer, even though they're not integer polynomials, they don't have integer coefficients, they take integer values, okay? And it's not too hard to show from continuity properties because the integers or the positive integers are dense in the p-adic integers 
that this is still true if you plug in a piatic integer for, to these polynomials. So even though they look like they shouldn't, these polynomials take integer values even when x is a piatic integer, okay, despite the factorials that occur in the denominator. So what does Mahler's theorem say? Mahler's theorem says that in a certain sense, these binomial polynomials form a kind of a basis for the space of continuous functions on ZP. So in what sense do they form a basis? Well, uh, it, what's true is that if you have any continuous function on ZP, it has a unique expansion of the form sum n goes from zero to infinity a of n x n, where the a of n are piatic numbers. If the values of f are in k, then the a of n are in k. And the condition is that the, the absolute values of the a of n's go to zero, piatically. And in fact, it's if and only if. So one of the miracles and one of the reasons why, even if you're forced to do analysis, there's an advantage to doing piatic analysis, is that piatically, a series converges if and only if the absolute, the piatic absolute value of its nth term goes to zero. <laughs> Sum of a n converges if and only if absolute value a n goes to zero. And with a little bit more work, you can show that this series un converges uniformly because these binomial polynomials are integer valued. So this limit is a continuous function. And any continuous function has a unique expansion in this form. So this gives us a very concrete representation of the space of continuous functions. Namely, they're determined by this sequence A of n of coefficients, subject to the condition that the norms of the A of n go to zero. So C of gk is isomorphic as a Banach space to the space of sequences, a0 of n, a1 of n, and so forth, sorry, a0, a1, and so forth, where the absolute values of the ai's go to zero piatically. And you add them pointwise, uh, just as you would, because if you add the functions together, you add the coefficients pointwise. How do you prove this? Well, there, yeah. Yes, P is fixed. Okay. Yes, you, can do, you have to do this separately for each P, even though it's the same set of polynomials, right? It's a completely, so for instance, yeah, it's the same set of polynomials, but it's, uh, they work differently in each, in each P. The topologies are different. So Mahler's theorem is a consequence of a, of a result that's really a, a fun thing to prove, which is that suppose you just have <clears throat> a function from the integers to the integers, okay? Then um, you can find a kind of a, a tail, there's a kind of a Taylor's theorem for these binomial polynomials using the finite difference operator. So the finite difference operator applied to a function is f of x plus one minus f of x, okay? And you can iterate that. So if you iterate, if, if you iterate it, you, uh, you get, for instance, f of x plus two minus two f of x plus one plus f of x, and you can work it out from there. And then you can evaluate that at zero. And it turns out you can always, if, if, if you just had a polynomial, if you have a polynomial function from z to z, then this eventually terminates. You get a finite uh, expansion. But if you just have a continuous piatic function and you do this expansion, it turns out that these difference operators actually go to zero piatically. Uh, and Keith has a nice set of notes uh, on his webpage that explains how to prove this. It's a very uh, clever argument. Uh, but the result is that this um, finite difference expansion for polynomials extends to an infinite extension ex expansion of an arbitrary continuous function. And that's uh, called Mahler's theorem. 
it's a lot of fun actually. And and Isaac Newton used this, uh, this these um, diff finite differences for interpolation back in Principia Mathematica, in the, whenever it was, 17th century. Okay, so the next ingredient that we need are the characters. So a character or a continuous character is a function which has the property that, right, f of a plus b is f of a times f of b. Because we're taking, our zp is additive, but we're taking a character into a multiplicative group. And since this thing is continuous, it's determined by where it sends the integers, because the integers are dense. And since the integers are dense and they're a cyclic group, they're such a character is entirely determined by where you send one. So a continuous character is determined by its value at one. So let's suppose f of one is a, and f of n has to be a to the n, where n is an integer. And then somehow it has to be the case that this extends to these infinite p-adic series. And so sometimes this is called interpolation. That is to say, you need to make sense of a to the n in cases where n is a p-adic number, not just an integer. But if it is an integer, you have to get what you would expect, okay? Um, and the only way this is gonna work is if a to the p to the n goes to one. Because if you think about a to this sum, it's a product, right? It's a to the something times a to the something to the p times a to the something to the p squared and so forth. Those terms had better go to one or this product isn't gonna converge. And the condition that a to the p to the n goes to one means a has to be congruent to one mod p. Because if it's not congruent to one mod p, it's in the cyclic group of p minus first roots of unity, and it's just gonna go round and round and round and round and round. So uh, you must have a congruent to one mod p, and it turns out you can make sense of this if a is congruent to one mod p. That is to say, to give a character is equivalent to giving an A such that the absolute value of A minus one is less than one, and the character then is F of N is A to the N, but N can be in ZP using the fact that you can work out a way to get this series to converge. If you've seen the p-adic logarithm and exponential, that's another approach to this. But we can use Mahler's theorem because if we use the binomial theorem, we have an identity of formal power series that one plus z, so let's suppose z is a constant here of absolute value less than one, okay? And x is a variable. The binomial theorem says one plus z to the x is the sum from zero to infinity of x choose i, z to the i, right? x is the variable, z is a p-adic number of absolute value less than one, so z to the i, goes to zero. So this is a Mahler expansion, and it gives us a continuous function, which is the character a to the x, where a is one plus z. Okay? So Mahler's theorem gives us this interpolation property. It allows us to raise things to p-adic powers. So we now have two of the ingredients of Fourier theory. We have our space, well, three. We have our group, we have our space of continuous functions, and we have our continuous characters. And we can even describe the space of continuous characters as this disk, the collection of things of the form one plus z, where the absolute value of z is less than one. And if you remember, the characters are supposed to be a group. And what group are they? Well, it's just the multiplicative group of these points in here. If you multiply two elements congruent to one mod p, they're still congruent to one mod p. That turns out to correspond to multiplication of characters. So uh, we have the space, we have the group, we have the space of functions, we have the space of characters, which form, in some sense, the p-adic dual group is the open unit disk. What were the other ingredients? Distributions. Well, Distributions or measures are elements of the dual space of the continuous functions. And so in this case, uh, we're looking at continuous functions, so continuous distributions. And it's a general property that one way to tell if your linear map is continuous is to see how much it magnifies things by. Okay, so you, you, one way to think of it is, is it takes a vector, if, if big vectors 
can get arbitrarily big when you apply lambda, then it's not continuous. And more formally, uh, if you just look at the value, that there should be a P on this as well, I guess. If you look at the maximum value, lambda of F is a number, the norm of F is a number, this ratio can't get, has to be bounded. If that ratio is bounded, then lambda is continuous. And it's enough to check when that this happens on the binomial polynomials. In other words, we need to know that lambda, this distribution applied to the binomial polynomials, these have supernorm one, they take integer values. So this had better be bounded for all n. And then because they're dense, that will be sufficient to give you the result in general. Well, go back to Mahler's theorem. Think about this, I mean, this is maybe not tremendously uh, rigorous, but remember that a continuous function looks like sum a n x n with the a n's going to zero. If you apply a linear map to that, the answer is determined by what happens to these xn's, leaving aside all that annoying stuff about convergence. So if these lambda, if lambda is continuous, these lambda xn's are bounded p-adically, and these an's go to zero p-adically. So this series converges because remember, to make a series converge, you just need to have the nth term go to zero, and if these numbers are bounded and these can be made as small as possible, these terms go to zero. So in fact, our distribution is completely determined by this collection of numbers. What happens if you integrate, so to speak, a binomial polynomial? And we can package those numbers up together to make a power series. These coefficients are what you get if you apply lambda to the binomial coefficients. And this is going to be a power series where the coefficients, the b of n, are less than some constant. That makes sense? So we have a kind of duality here. On the one hand, we have sequences whose nth term goes to zero periodically. And on the other hand, we have sequences whose, nth ter whose terms are bounded. And we can take their dot product, and that gives us a number because those series converge. And that's the duality between continuous distributions and continuous functions in the, so to speak, basis given by the Mahler expansion. So I've written that here in this fancy way. If you take a power series with bounded coefficients and a continuous function written in Mahler expansion, then the dot product, so to speak, or the evaluation of this distribution on this function is this sum, which converges. If you've seen in the classical case, the L zero, L infinity, uh, where you have summable sequences and bounded sequences, L1, L1, and this, you see? I should have paid more attention in that analysis. Huh? Anyway, this kind of is like that, okay? And note it, and there's the same issue with double duals. So we're not, you know, if you take the dual of the space of distributions, things get bad. So we're not gonna do that. So now we have our Fourier transform, because remember, a Fourier transform takes a distribution and converts it to a function on the space of characters. By, and the value of that function at a character is the distribution applied to the character. And here we have this great um, uh, result, namely the Fourier transform of distribution of our of our distribution lambda is a power series, and the character phi z of x is one plus z to the x. And what happens? Let me see. I think I have it in the next. Yeah. By definition, the value of the Fourier series, Fourier transform of lambda at a character is just what you get if you plug the character into the distribution. But it's nicer than that. Because if we write our uh, distribution in terms of a power series where the C of n's are the values gotten by the Mahler coefficients, and if we write phi of z as a character using the binomial theorem, and you compute this duality pairing here, this is the character, the Mahler expansion of the character. The t to the n's are like the dual basis to the xn's. And so when you compute this pairing, what do you get? 
you get the effect of plugging z to the n in for z in for t. This is pretty formal. Because the, the way this pairing works is you take c of n, z to the n, because the t to the n and the xn are like the dual basis and in the pairing. In other words, if we think about a distribution as being given by a power series, its Fourier transform is the function on this character variety, which is given by that power series, which converges because the coefficients of the power series are bounded and the value that we're plugging in has absolute value less than one, and so its powers go to zero piadically. And that's the piadic Fourier transform. So what this means is that this space of distributions, D of G of QP, can be identified as the space of formal power series whose coefficients are bounded piadically. And inside that, you can take the power series, the formal power series, which are integer, have, which have coefficients whose they're all bounded by one, so they're piadic integers. And this space, which is the formal power series, with integer coefficients is called the Iwasawa algebra. And it's a ring, which is not apparent, but rings don't occur by magic in mathematics. And there's a reason it's a ring. In fact, it's a general fact that the distributions on a group form a ring. And this is a consequence of an operation known as convolution, which you may have seen in the context of classical Fourier analysis. There is, a, I didn't want to get into it, but there is a convolution operator in this setting as well. And it means that D of GK is automatically a ring. And the Iwasawa algebra, the ring structure on the Iwasawa algebra is convolution of measures. So, um, and so in this, this is the, the, the Iwasawa algebra is the unit ball in this bigger ring where the coefficients are bounded and not necessarily random. Now you've probably heard of well, maybe I'll just do a couple of things real quick. Um, you might, what we know how to integrate um, characters. That was sort of what we did before. But uh, you can turn this around. And if instead of thinking about 1 plus t to the x as uh, t being the variable, remember the, the character was 1 plus z to the x, where x was the variable and z was fixed. But you can turn this around and think about the power series where t is the variable and x is fixed. And when you expand that out using the binomial theorem, you get a distribution whose coefficients are x and, but now these are numbers because x is a fixed number and t is the variable. And what distribution is that? Well, if you compute the pairing against a character, it's sort of turned the other way around you end up evaluating, now is, uh, the very, you get phi z of x. In other words, you have end up evaluating the character at x. So this turns out to be the Dirac distribution. One plus t to the x as a power series in t is the Dirac distribution in x. Whereas one plus z to the x as a power series in, as a Mahler expansion in x is the character that corresponds to z. And if you want a little more fun, you might ask, what about the function x to the n? And it turns out that um, if you want to evaluate a distribution on the function x to the n, well, you would need to compute the Mahler expansion of x to the n. And that's kind of annoying, except that you can notice this fact. And um, by doing some, uh, in the interest of time, I won't spend too much time on it, but the formula that emerges from this is that if you want to compute if you want to compute the distribution corresponding to a power series to the function x uh, applied to the function x to the n, what you do is you take 1 plus t d by dt, apply it to f n times, and evaluate it at t equals 0. So in some sense, the coefficients, it's some mixed up version of the, of the Taylor polynomial coefficients of, of f because of the 1 plus t, uh, which gives you the integral of x to the n. And uh, so now I promised you applications. And so I have, what, three minutes to give you applications. That's about what I figured would happen. So um, what this 
approach to the theory of distributions was originally come up, uh, originally due to Barry Mazur, who was trying to reinterpret the uh, construction of the kubota leopold piatic zeta function. So the kubota leopold piatic zeta function is a piatic function of S. It's an analytic function of a piatic variable, which if you plug the right values in for S, agrees with the classical Riemann zeta function at those values for S. Getting everything right is a little bit of annoying because there's normalizations involved and so forth. But basically, the special values of the Riemann zeta function are Bernoulli numbers. If, if you think about Bernoulli numbers as something of the form B sub N as a function of N, then if there's congruence relations among the N, there's congruence relations among the Bernoulli numbers, which means that the Bernoulli numbers are kind of a piatically continuous function of N once we get the normalizations right. And that continuous function is the Riemann zeta function, uh, is the kubota leopold piatic zeta function. I think the cleanest and most elegant way and the most modern way to construct those piatic L functions now, not just the zeta function, but all the Dirichlet L functions and so forth, is through this type, and even for elliptic curves, is through this type of um, Fourier analysis. Namely, you have to figure out what the right F is so that the right-hand side of this equation, here I can even show you, you have to figure out the right-hand, the, the correct F, so that when you compute this, you get some version of the Riemann zeta function on the right-hand side. That's one element of the construction of the zeta function. The other element is you'd like to be able to vary this K. And the way I have done this, you really can't, um, because X to the K as it mean x here is a variable. This is the polynomial x to the k. But it turns out that if you play some games with moving between the multiplicative group and the additive group, you can actually make this k into an s. And if you happen to plug in s equals an integer, you get a value of the Riemann zeta function. If you plug in s some random piatic number, you get some random piatic number out. Uh, so this is the beginning of um, Iwasawa theory because it turns out that the polynomial, the power series that you plug in, the distribution that you're interested in, turns out to have a lot of arithmetic significance as well through the theory of circular units and elliptic units. So in a certain way, all I've done is kind of open the door to a particular uh, pathway into Iwasawa theory. If you would like to learn more about this. So there's Keith's very, uh, clean and typically Conradian explanation of Mahler expansions, uh, which is on his website. And you can find it by Googling Mahler expansions Conrad, which is a gen in general Google mathematics topic. Conrad is a very good approach to uh, finding a nice write-up. I relied on uh, a, a, some kind of an expository article by Jacinto and Williams, who, by the way, thank Keith in the article for explaining Mahler, which actually constructs the piatic L functions by this method. And then you could, uh, amazingly enough, Larry Washington's book is not uh, online in the library, but chapter 13 of Washington's Introduction to Cyclotomic Fields gives a very nice construction. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. And then if you're interested in more of the sort of general theory, uh, Udi de Chalit has a very nice paper called Mahler Bases and Elementary Piatic Analysis. And then if you really want to get into it, you can read his book on piatic L functions of elliptic curves, where he applies this to construct L functions of elliptic curves, which is complex multiplication. Kedlaya and Bargava, or Bargava and Kedlaya have a nice paper where they think about Mahler expansions, not just for ZP, but for kind of, they ask about properties of the underlying set. And then uh, I have a paper with Schneider where we, draw a close connection between a more general type of piatic Fourier theory where you look not just at ZP, but the rings of integers and extensions of QP, which turns out to have um, really, I mean, it's ancient news now, but at the time, very surprising to me connections to um, the theory of formal groups and the hodge tate decomposition. So um, you can look there. And I, these are actually links but because I did something wrong, they're not blue. But I'm gonna post these slides somewhere and when, by the time I post them, I will have figured out how to make them blue. That's my project. Okay, thank you very much and I'm happy to take questions.